Well, thanks again for everyone viewing. For those of you who don't know, I'm Vanessa Briones, pronouns she, her, and I was um, honored to be the guest curator for Mata Art Gallery, um, which is directed by Nika. And I curated the show called While We Are Here. And if you want to check it out, you can head over to the website at mataartgallery.org. It's best viewed on a desktop, but look at it however you want or check out the Instagram. And today we're going to be interviewing one of the artists who participated in the show that I'm super grateful for as a colleague and a friend of mine, Matt Perez. And um, before we get started, I just wanted to begin with a land acknowledgement. I'm here streaming from Sacramento, California, woo, Sacktown, um, which is the ancestral homeland of the Nisenan, Maidu, Miwok, and Mewak peoples who are the indigenous peoples of this land. Um, so just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that. Um, and then if you have any questions that come up during this interview, this is gonna be more like kind of a coffee, living room chat, informal. Um, but if anyone who's viewing wants to have, leave a comment or ask a question. Our gallery director, Nika, will be monitoring the comments below and you can leave them there. And when we get to a moment, we'll go ahead and um, bring those up during this conversation. So does that sound good? Awesome. Well, just to start off, Matt, can you just tell us kind of how about yourself and how you got your start as an artist? Yeah, I'm uh, Matt Perez and um, I started working on art in, uh, pretty much 2011. Um, I always liked to draw and everything growing up or whatever, uh, but I really started um, learning about techniques and everything uh, through the University of Southern Indiana. Um, yeah, it was really just about, uh, I'll tell you the story about how I kind of just started. Yeah. Um, I was a caretaker for developmentally disabled people and they had um, the city called on them because they had uh, kind of a lot of growth uh, and a lot of like weeds and stuff. And um, so I spent all weekend cutting down all this um, greenery and everything. And there was this piece of chicken wire that was kind of stuck in the earth and everything. And uh, I just started, you know, hard work and persistence trying to clear out this whole area and on the last day it finally like kind of popped up and it was like kind of like uh almost like an epiphany where like the light shined on the chicken wire all nice and it like glowed all crazy and <laughs> I don't know why but I saw a polar bear like just like the back and I don't know why it, like it was almost just like um it was almost like fate almost so that night I went home and I bought a chicken, a roll of chicken wire and I took apart all my wire hangers to try to make this bear. I ended up making a bear head. And um, at this point of college, I was a journalism major. And uh, all I really liked doing was drawing the cartoons for the paper. So I wasn't really a journalism major. I didn't really know what everything was or, you know, just the terminology and all that stuff. And um, I ended up walking into the art department with this newly constructed polar bear head. And they said, um, yeah, you need to be an art major. So I just wow. kind of went, hit the ground running and just started, um, just started making art, like really taking it seriously and really just um, like, I don't know, it was, I think I, loved art so much but you know when you're younger kind of you know when I was growing up people were kind of distracting me away from it saying like you don't want to be you know the starving artist or the working you know this and that and so I never really took it seriously and then when I started you know um started showing that I had like kind of like uh, a knack for it that's when I just hit the ground running and I knew that I wanted to do it and yeah, it's been amazing ever since really, yeah. So you were are already kind of enjoying art when you were younger, it just wasn't yes. something that, yeah. What was yeah. it like having someone say, you see the sculpture and you're like, yep, this is what you need to do? It was pretty cool. It, you know, um, 
I talked to my professors about it and I felt very lost, like just kind of like flowing through, just not really knowing what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And I didn't really have a, um, you know, I didn't really have a lot of goals or anything, you know, I thought that I was going to be like a factory worker because my uncles, my grandpa, my dad all worked at um, Inland Steel. It's Metal Steel now. And uh, I don't know, I thought I, that I was just going to go and get a degree and then just become kind of like a factory worker. And uh, yeah, and as soon as someone started telling me like, everything is like, you know, you're doing the right thing with this art, you know, I just started, uh, yeah, I just, it felt really good. I always tell my professors that I was like, I felt like I was lost until I found art. And then, yeah, it's crazy how you can just make that pivot like that, especially it was your undergrad, right? Where you were a journalism yeah. major and switched. Yeah. I switched my major probably like five times when I was an undergrad, had no idea. Yeah, and you go straight out of high school and you're like, how I haven't had life yet. I don't know what I want to do. This sounds good. Yeah. And it's like, you don't really think about the things that like, I don't know. I always had this idea of like, either you follow your heart or you follow the wealth and mm -hmm. you start liking the thing that you're making money in or you start making money doing what you love and I'm hoping for the latter you know that's like what my kind of philosophy is yeah I, I'm an idealist like that too I'm hoping that you know if you get into something because your goal is to make money it's a very different feeling and outcome yeah. and if your your priority is to do what you're passionate about and then let the rest kind of follow yes Nico yeah. looks like relates to we're always pressured to find our career. What's the next step? What's your game plan? And yeah. um, being an artist, it's like so counter to that. You're following intuition. You're taking these risks that you can't calculate what's coming next. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, I don't know. It's just when you're in your studio and you're just zoning out into this creative process, everything kind of just melts away. And that's like what, I love about it. It's just that it's, you know, not only is it like challenging and, you know, like energizing, but it's therapeutic and it's like, I don't know, it's uh, you tap into something else and it becomes second nature. And it's yeah. just, I don't know, it's, I'm so glad I decided to pursue it. It's like amazing. Yeah. Love it. That's awesome. And then you continued on into graduate school and got your MFA from PNCA. And was there a gap between when you when you got your undergrad and deciding you wanted to keep going for that MFA? Or how did that transition and yes. going on to grad school go? Yeah, it um, what happened was that I graduated undergrad in 2000 this, the winter of 2015. I was like a December graduate and um, the university that I went to offered this uh, um, opportunity called the Ephraimson Family Bridge Year Fellowship, mm -hmm. which it gave me this like amazing studio for the year. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to uh, exhibit at this university at the University of Southern Indiana. So I applied for it um, in 2000 and 17 and I was the um, fellow for the year of 2017 uh, and then it uh, I ended up having a solo show in um, I think March of 2018 and then that following um, fall was when I was at PNCA but it was um, I was in Evansville Indiana Southern Indiana and uh, yeah it was um, it was wild, like what we were learning there, like everything technical and all about uh, just technique. And then, um, you know, learning how to craft something to perfection, because that's like what our professors were all about. They were all about um, the finished piece, you know, like how does yeah. it, how does it look? How does it connect with the viewer through craftsmanship? And then, um, yeah, and then when I came to PNCA, it was a little bit more conceptual and everything, but uh, I still kind of, like, leaned heavy on my, like, techniques and stuff still. Yeah, and for one quick side note, we have a Michael Miller wanted to make sure you know it's a well-deserved scholarship USI yeah. represents, so that's awesome. Yeah. Very well-deserved. Um, I 
a couple of things that come to my mind with that is I think a lot of times there's this joke in grad school that um, for art that you get so heavily focused on the concept. Like, I don't know if you've seen memes or they're like, and now this is what the art I make after grad school. And there's like not technique or whatever. And yeah. so it's very clear in your work that 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 focus on the craft has been very um, consistent through your work throughout grad school. Um, and so then it's when you were going through it, it seemed that the conceptual part was the part that then you were figuring out where do those, where do those intersect? Um, but yeah. I know that, you know, what your craft is just incredible. You pay attention to details, your, your um, materials you use are so clear. And um, as you've gotten through um, your MFA, I'd love to hear how did that experience of figuring out how the conceptual meet what you were making visually and how would you say you talk about your work now with those two um really unique intersections yeah well I think that um what PNCA allowed me to do was really it was almost like um like a kind of like a inward looking therapy mm -hmm. um to where you start asking a lot of the questions you ask are why, you know, and mm -hmm. um, not so much, you know, with the technique, it's how everybody wants to know how and how you did it. And, um, but, you know, when you really start um, evaluating, uh, you know, self evaluating, you start getting to the bottom of why you do the things you do and why you gravitate towards certain you know, patterns or why you gravitate towards certain, um, you know, adornment. And it was always really, you know, um, I think the thing about it was I wanted to capture what it felt like being a minority within mm -hmm. these places that lack diversity. That's what I kind of got out of it was the amount of attention that the surface of a figure, um, holes you know right and I, I really like that idea of we're in this space that you know is kind of um you're there to be critical you know in a gallery space in a gallery setting you're there to be critical you're there to analyze what's on the walls what's on space and I really like that idea of you know you put these things under so much scrutiny and so much, um, you know, just you're, they're just hyper visible, you know, these artworks are so hyper visible on the wall. And that's kind of like how I felt in some regards mm, mm -hmm. that I felt like, um, you know, it's kind of like one of the things that I was struggling with was getting out of a place that didn't have that much diversity and then coming to Portland where the diversity was a little bit better, but it's still, I still kind of felt that underlying kind of thing, you know, and I wanted to explore that. I wanted to explore like what the surface of the figure becomes in order to accommodate not only other people's perceptions, but my own perception. Like, why do I, you know, like, why do I feel like I need to have like long hair? Why do I feel like I need to wear the clothes that I need to wear? Why do I feel like I need to do that? You know, like all these things that kind of um, arise within this self-evaluation. And I think that that was the connecting point was that I was always kind of um, adorning my figures surfaces with like texture and color and all this stuff. And in grad school, I started you know, putting, you know, two and two together. And it was like, well, I do that to myself. I put on earrings and I put on necklaces and I put on, you know, the clothing that I wear and, you know, and it's like this kind of construction of self, you know, mm -hmm. and construction of identity. And, you know, I start thinking about like, what what does figurative sculpture bring to that? Like, what does a figurative sculpture bring to that? Like, what does that, you know, how does, you know, I'm asking so much of my materials and my artwork. I'm asking them to not only portray what I want them to portray, but sit in space and take in all these eyes, you know? And I started putting myself into the, the spot of my sculptures. 
and my artwork. And it's like, man, I'm asking them to do so much for me. I got to give them something to kind of combat that. I have to give them something to kind of, um, like, how would I feel if I was asked to stand alone in a room? Like, what would right. I write? What would I, you know, what would I want to say? What would my gesture be? Like, would I be, you know, like, would I confront somebody? Would I be more relaxed? Would I be more reserved? And I started thinking about personifying my sculptures. And that's kind of like what the conceptual thing was, was that I like really loved it. Was like, started really like thinking about like, oh, this sculpture's got an attitude. This sculpture yeah. wouldn't take that. Or this, you know, like I really started, um, like I think, uh, it almost became like story writing where I was this writer telling this story about this person and like, yeah, they're taking its own personality on almost yeah. and yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and different forms and each of your forms are so like distinct, but also clearly have a relation. And um, as you were talking, there's a question that came up for me and uh, um, Nika just hit it even phrase it even better but um so I'll, I'll ask that in a moment but I know for me you were talking about coming to PNCA and confronting the fact that what does it mean to be a minority you know I grew up in Sacramento which is very diverse and then from there went to LA same story so when I showed up at PNCA for those of you who don't know Matt and I both went to grad school um different programs but both MFAs and um, I was sitting in a room and someone turned to me and said, you as a person of color, what do you think? And I was like, who, me? I'm, no, no, I'm not. I'm just Filipino. I'm not like, oh, I am. Okay. And so then I suddenly too was putting this pressure on my work to yeah. be this, be everything. Like all these feelings I was feeling, then all of a sudden I'm questioning like, okay, so does that mean that these sculptures that are, have nothing to do with how I'm feeling, but are my, what I'm feeling is going into them. Yeah. Where is, where is that line? Like, and then suddenly it's like, I'm, you're feeling like the way you're describing your sculptures are hyper visible. And so I know for me and um, my partner talk about a lot like there, and we, I think talk with you about that, what goes into the work and what's actually is in the work. And so before I get to, Nika's question I'd first love to hear like what knowing what you just described that goes into your work and that experience you've had that had a thread through these predominantly white spaces stepping back and now that you're you what we're like out of grad school year or two now um what do you think is in the work that you want your audience to connect with what are those like grand granules of your experience that you're hoping that they experience and looking at what you create yeah I think just um when I want, first off, I really want someone to connect with my work just on, like, I want to, like, inspire awe just because of my technique. I think that, yeah. that, and that's within myself, I think that, you know, there's always this, uh, I want to show how hard I work on them, because not only are there a negative connotation towards artists in this, like, kind of there's like this idea of an artist being lazy or uh you know this uh, like arrested development kind of childish kind of thing and I want to really show people that I work hard at this like this is my life this is what I want people to see like I want people to see how hard I work when I create these objects you know because arts, you know, a lot of it is like a labor of love. We don't have, mm -hmm. you know, there's not overtime, you know, you don't have a monetary thing to where like, this is what you're worth. This is how many hours you worked on it. This is what it is. You know, a lot of that is just subjective, you know, and I'm from a culture, this working class mentality where, you know, you hear keywords like midnights or three to elevens or overtime or picking up a shift or you know these words that kind of ring synonymous with the working class and you know you're rewarded by how hard you work you know you're rewarded within you know within my household and within the communities that I grew up with the harder you work the more money you make the more satisfied you are you know but 
in the art world, it doesn't necessarily ring true to that, you know? And I totally. think there's this idea of, um, I think that there's this idea of uh, proving to myself that I can work as hard as I can, you know? Yeah, and, and carrying um, that experience through from what's like ingrained in you into yeah. your practice and your own experience in your own way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think that what I want the viewer to take out of it is, I don't know, I really want them to just look at my work and I want it to leave with them. I know that I've seen work that I, I don't think about it again after I walk out of the gallery, you know. I see work sometimes that I will never, like I remember the first time I saw uh, like a Catherine Bradford painting, like I remember that or like a Luis Flores sculpture or like a Rodin or like all these different kind of things, you know, where they stay with me. And that's the art that I appreciate. And that's the art that I want to produce is this stuff that'll stay with you. And, you know, like two years from when you first saw it, you know, you could be just doing some mundane thing and just my sculpture will pop into your head. Like, Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah. That. You know, I think that that's, one of the coolest things about being an artist is that, you know, I always say that art has this ability to affect you in a way that only like a loved one can, you know, like it's, it's it operates. So yeah. On a different level. And yeah. I mean, we've talked about this and before and part of what was inspiring me to um, go in the direction of that, that title of while we are here, because we were talking about like in this moment as artists, we, can leave a mark or join a conversation that transcends place and time. And I know for me, there's definitely been those artists that were like, I've seen a lot of art, but that were those moments where that pivoted me some, in some way, in some way in life, whether it's art related or just life related, you know, I still yeah. remember the show I saw that was like, you know, I think I'm going to go to grad school for my MFA. And yeah. it's great to think about yourself. Like we talked about, we've talked about before is like looking at, the future looking back at your work and thinking what what will they have what will people take away what how they will experience my work yeah that's yeah. awesome um a couple questions coming up that will change kind of the direction of the conversation but one more piece like question specifically relating to um you know we're talking about the actual like physicality of your work is I never heard that story of your chicken um, wire before. And yeah. that now to this day, that's still a very um, uh, predominant material. That's kind of a, something you see, I can't think of the word. That's like the thing that you kind of see throughout that common thread. Um, what has that material meant to you? And um, how, why is that one that's one you've decided to stick with all these years? You know, I think that um, I used to work as a, a subcontractor for a steel mill. And I think that a lot of the area, Northwest Indiana, was kind of um, a lot of Latin people went over there because of the steel mill and the work and everything. And I think it's kind of like my ode to all of that, you know, and that's kind of like where I connected, you know, where I connect to it, my historical connection to it is that I came from a family of, you know, my dad was a crane operator at a steel mill, you know, like all these different jobs within this steel mill. That's kind of like my historical kind of connection to it. But as like a personal, I just love how malleable it is. Mm -hmm. I love that it is it is both rigid and transparent. And I feel mm -hmm. like that is what um, I want the surface of my sculptures to be. Like I want them to have some type of density, but still be translucent within that. Yeah. And I think that um, it's a very utilitarian material. When I first discovered it, I was in Southern Indiana and there was like a lot of, um, a lot of just like, hard working blue collar farm hand kind of association to this material. Uh, so I think I use it, I used it in Southern Indiana as this connection to the viewer where mm -hmm. I could pull them in with something that is 
a utilitarian material that is in everyday use, you know, but I could transform it and I can, yeah. you know, I can really make it my own and I can have it, you know, it's essentially what I was doing. It was, I was in this area and I kind of created my own language towards it. You know, like I try to create my own language living within that space. And I kind of felt this connection to chicken wire because I was creating another language with this material. And that's like what I really just, I just gravitated towards it. And it was like, I always talk about it as like this, uh, it's almost like a metal clay just because of how malleable it is. Mm -hmm. and it holds the shape and it just, I don't know. It was just, I, I, I just found that material and I was like, I just, it's for me that it yeah. is for me. I don't know what I've it was. I think it has that nice sweet spot of it has like a personal significance. It has a material function and it's um, recognizable and we all have different associations with the material like that. So, yeah. and then you use it in a way that um, isn't like outright recognizable. Um, and then yeah. it kind of plays into a various different themes in your work, which is great. And something I, I noticed about your work is, you know, going back to revisiting that conversation about um, being a minority and experiencing that when you're making your work and re and now thinking of that conceptually um, I like that your work isn't it, it doesn't kind of, it's not so direct it's not explicitly about that you know it's not yeah. what's you like you said I want the viewer to walk away and remember it but we can read different things in it and I know for me um, in grad school there was this pressure of Kind of, this is going to go to Nika's question. She said for both of us, at any point during your experience in grad school in Portland as an artist of color, do you feel that you were pressured to play identity politics in your work or a type of oppression Olympics in a predominantly white institution? And I think there's a tendency, especially um, in certain areas and demographics to play like the marge, like woke Olympics or like who is the most marginalized. And then in a work as an artist, for me, it's been like, oh, so am I supposed to speak to this in like a way that you can look at my work and say, oh, poor you, you've been through a lot, you know? And you're like, oh, no, that's not <laughs> necessarily what I'm trying to say. Like, I, this is part of me, but it's not necessarily all I want to talk about. And in your work, I haven't, you know, you don't look at it and think, okay, this is exactly what he's talking about, of being about being this identity. And so I'd love to hear, you know, do, your experience. Did you feel that pressure? How did you navigate that? I think that there were um, individuals that pressured me more to talk about that. I think that there were individuals that wanted me to explore, like a couple of my mentors were great. They told yeah. me, whatever you want to talk about, talk about it. Whatever you want to be influenced by, influ you know, be influenced by it. And I think that the pressure was from, I think that people who want to know about your experience want to know about the tra traumatic parts of your experience because that's what... Um, I don't know. It's just, I think that people, some people are more interested by your traumas as yeah. a brown body. And I think that what I try to do is I try to make people like think about that, but I don't want to dwell on that because it's right. not healthy for me either. You know, like I use, I use my art to work through these kind of things to work through these kind of things. So when I um, am asked about it, or when I kind of, um, you know, I think that the main thing is just one, taking control of what you want to talk about, mm, what great, you yeah. want to let people in on, because some people are an open book, and some people aren't, you know, and I think that as long as you have control over that, it should be okay. But yeah, there were times where, you know, people, I would talk about my art and they would say, no, it's not about that. It's about this. Start diving deeper. And then it becomes almost like a therapy session. And right. it's, it's to the point where you don't, 
you know, you start to wonder if everybody has to do that. Like you start wondering if your other classmates within your cohort are having to go through this psychoanalytical kind of like, you know, like therapy session. And I think that people want to know, some people want to know what it's like being a minority and then they begin to fetishize it. They begin yeah. to do all this, like, it's like, oh yeah, this and that. And then, I don't know, it's, people are very strange and it's on a person to person basis, you know? Like I had one studio visit where they wanted me to talk about all the things that were like, oh, how was it over here? And how was it over there? And, you know, how was this? And, you know, and I talked about it or whatever. And when I was done talking about it, they said, yes, that's what it's about. That's what your art's about. And it's like, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of draining um, because there are people that'll come into your studio and ask so much of you, like rehash all of your trauma, talk about this and that, and then they leave and they, you know, and then you're stuck in your studio still working through that you know and, and then, then emotionally like, drained and yeah, <laughs> emotionally yeah. put on the spot and yes yes and it's yeah. so tough too because right now we're in a moment in art that um if like nika just said in the comments that non-identity based work isn't hip like being writing work about your identity is what's hip right now and there's nothing wrong with that we there's a space for everything but when you're someone who's like well I don't really need it to be about my identity. I prefer you not read my diary. Thank you very much. Um, it's a tough space to navigate as an artist. Yeah. Yeah. I think that when you really think about it, like reverse engineering, what do you want your art to accomplish? And yeah. what do you want? You know, for me, it's like what I said, I want the connection with people and I don't mm -hmm. want to necessarily alienate anybody and I don't want to make anybody feel like you know because it's at the end of the day I'm only speaking for myself right the grouping that other people put me in you know like the identity this and that and this and that you know it's like you said it's like when you're in a diverse place you're just you you know and then when you get to a place where you're different they ask you to put yourself in a category they ask you you know you you're no longer an artist you're an artist of color you know you're no longer uh this you're uh, this and that and this you know so what i want to accomplish with my art is i want to have some sense of unity but i want people to know that my story is unique and my art is unique because of my story you know and that's the thing that um, I hope people get, but yeah, it's just, there are those instances where people just want, I don't know. There's just people like people get different things from my art, you know, and people will get different things from everybody's art, you know? Yeah. And they'll, that's the thing that I learned in grad school was they emphasized what is it about? Like you have to know what it's about so much or else someone else is going to come in here and tell you what it's about. And the thing that I struggled with was, you know, I had this thought, like, why does it have to be anything other than the viewer, like what the viewer needs it to be? Like, right. why, why do I have to take so much of the narrative away from the viewer, you know? And I think that that's where I was kind of, um, kind of like, uh, at odds a little bit where I was kind of trying to say, oh, technique and this and that. And everybody was like, well, what's the story behind it? And I think that there was always kind of this push and pull within that, you know, but um, I don't know. I just want, I want people to view me as, you know, a really good artist that is just, you know, I don't know. It's just one of those things to where like, I, I want my art to speak for itself and I don't want to, um, I don't want to say it's one thing and drastically change the interpretation 
of the piece for somebody, you know? But, yeah, I like how you say that. And um, someone commented, which makes me think of this, um, Millard Mendez, I apologize if I'm not, that's Millard. the handle. Um, Millard, oh, thank you. Um, that your work is strong for us. I think the biography is part of what you do, but is not all of what you do. And I think that's yeah. the beauty of one of the things I personally love about art is, is that subjectiveness. There isn't one yeah. thing to take away that there's many different avenues of discourse we can have. And in today's society, we need variety of discourse. Like there isn't yeah. one particular yeah. one, one right or wrong one, just to have it and to have it together. And then for your art to leave room for that and not be, you know, prescriptive, which is really great. And, um, Oh, and also just commenting on Nika had set, shared in there and artist grants and fellowships and applications, they expect us to sell our identity and oppression too, um, and make us kind of compete our, com us compete our trauma to get our money, which their money, which is tough because we're trying to take these opportunities. It is a part of who we are. It is a conversation to have. And then it also is a conversation to have that about your technique, about your craft and which you clearly put a lot of time and and thought into. Um, I think a good, this would be a good time to bring in, um, I, the handles, uh, Taryn Klee, I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, they kind of talking more on the visual language, the craft side, but also inserting it into, um, uh, categories of art discourse or, um, that have happened before. She said, Matt, for you, what const or they said, uh, Matt, for you, what constitutes the visual language associated with Latinx futurism is futurism a concept that is able to be imagined without the influence of Western techno utopianism. Um, do those, so are you familiar? It's an, an okay, if not, because sometimes these are big words and big concepts, but do you re recall what um, Latinx futurism is or Western techno utopianism maybe referring to? Uh, I'm not too sure on the latter, the yeah. And utopian but can you speak maybe to um do you know much about latinx futurism uh the way that i kind of handled it was in the same vein as kind of like a futuristic storytelling uh almost like a sci-fi kind of thing and um i was thinking about Latin X futurism because uh everything that was going on with the kind of like this like the billionaire space race kind of thing and mm -hmm. thinking about it in regards to uh kind of like the contemporary setting that we're staying in today is where there are these rich billionaires kind of fighting for you know how they get to space faster and, you know, there's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done on Earth still, you know? And I yeah. think that's kind of like where I was coming from with the Latinx futurism was this idea of there's a certain type of person wanting to explore space right now, while there's another type of person struggling on the surface. And I was thinking about it in regards to like I was going through a lot of thoughts within the creating the piece specifically. And I was thinking about how space exploration to me is both simultaneously nostalgic and uh, like sci-fi in the future. And, yeah. you know, and it's like this idea of, harken back to a time in the 60s when they were headed towards the moon and there was such civil unrest and i started thinking about this kind of re re rep repetition of 2020 was such a polarizing year with you know civil unrest again and then we're there's a whole group of people trying to reach it to the moon or trying to make it to space. And it kind of, I started thinking about the cyclical nature of what's happening and what needs to happen. And I was thinking about like, maybe the first way that we make it to space is through story. 
So it's like Latinx, you know, put that idea in your head that it's like spaces for us too. And it's not just for a certain group of people. It's not for a certain income, you know, it's not, it's for, you know, it's like one of those things to where like, if, I don't know, it was just one of those things to where I wasn't seeing it. I wasn't seeing yeah. Latin space explorer explorers i wasn't you know and it was like i was sitting inside of a house during a pandemic not really yeah moving. people are like protesting and you know trying to make a difference and then there's just people trying to leave the planet and it's like all very it was all kind of flowing in my in my thought process and i was like well i'm gonna make this piece that is um you know just kind of speaking about that uh as far as like i'm not too sure about the the second half of the question with like yeah that. i'm not familiar with that too much either um to be honest i'm a little bit rusty on these terms and i think um what you were talking about with the futurisms there's so many different futurisms you know like um afrofuturism indigenous futurism and i think like for me, the thing like to distill it down to is kind of um, like imagining like a world in the future based upon ancestral or previous past um, uh, like values and ideals and traditions. But what's weird is to think about that in a in in the middle of a pandemic like you're bringing up of like yeah. um, we it feels like we are in a just I mean we are in some ways in this dystopian world and then. Um, let's see i think she there's an explanation into uh i was wondering about mm -hmm. settler colonization of space which so then we're thinking about we're thinking about colonialism yeah. of of space or eve and you can even think of it not even just like the actual physical space but in just all of our society how it's kind of been our our minds and everything have been colonized by like western ideals we can't really yeah. we can't really um, t divorce ourselves of that reality we're living in. And I can see why that was brought up in relation to your work, because there is something really um, fantastical and future forward facing of your work. And going back to what you've said in the past, like it's like this beacon um, in this moment that you're thinking of that's kind of projecting itself in the future. Um, and since we only, because I know this maxes out at um, an hour at one and we're hitting about 14 minutes left, I feel like this would be a really good segue to even just hear about the body of work you chose for this show. Um, why did you choose the pieces you chose and what, if you want to talk about one in particular and show us it, or if um, you want to talk about it as a grouping, whatever, whatever you feel is most appropriate would be great. Yeah. Well, the whole reason, like, kind of to speak that back to what we were talking about is, like, while we were here, and um, I uh, was starting to think about lineage, you know, there was, uh, I lost my last grandparent, so that was kind of fresh in my memory. Uh, I was unable to see her, uh, so it was kind of like this idea of... Um, this like act of processing while being alone. And I would talk to my family and they were all together and, you know, they were all mm -hmm. by her mm -hmm. deathbed and everything. And I wasn't, me and two of other, two of my other cousins weren't there. So I was starting to think about just um, a lot of reflection and a lot of uh, just kind of like that. And then I started you know, on the opposite end, I always try to, like, I don't know, I was reflecting. So then I was like, man, you know, you inevitably think like, what's going to happen in the future? What's going to happen when I'm 93 years old? And, yeah. You know, and what's going to happen 100 years after I'm 93 years old? And it's like this idea of we're only as strong as the foundation that we are growing from. You know, mm. I was mm -hmm. thinking about like the things that I loved about my grandma, the things I loved about my mom. And then I started thinking about like, man, where did my grandma learn that? 
where did you mm-hmm. know just like all the way down the line like what are these traits that i respect so much within my family how far does that b- go back you know and i yeah. said about like like cave people you know giving side eye because like my grandma could side eye the best <laughs> like thinking of like my 15 time great 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 grandma you know and just like just like you know and then I started thinking about this idea of like propelling that forward and so that's where this like traveler kind of came through Mm. it's like this idea of like a time traveler looking for I called it absolute bliss but it's really just um it's like kind of like these traits that I admire you know and it's kind of like these like little nuggets of um culture or like little nuggets of identity and that's like how we build ourselves into the next generation you know so I was thinking about um I could just show you this one yeah well there's that one this right. one it's right there. oh it's fun to see it in that size yeah it's you so I really just so interesting of experiencing a digital space and then kind of feeling more of a a physical space here in a video yeah yeah Yeah, I just I don't know I just started here I'll try to get it but yeah you can kind of oh yeah but that's all just yeah yeah I just I was thinking about that um kind of just uh I don't know. I didn't, I didn't want to think about it as kind of like um, in search for resources or search for anything like that. I didn't want to like make it seem like, uh, like I was uh, thinking about colonizing space. I was thinking about kind of like, I wanted to think of, think of it more as like, almost just like observing and collecting maybe like being able to travel all these different time periods and see like what you admire within your bloodline you know and uh, yeah I don't know I was I think that I really wanted to just dive deep into something after like my grandma passed and I think that that was kind of like the thing was like I wanted to um just it was like the therapy of it you know like I I needed to fall into a bigger project and really um just kind of like challenge myself because it was I don't know it was just one of those things to where I have to I have to overload my brain with a lot of different things so I don't feel sad I feel like sometimes so I was yeah. like, I'm just gonna make art for 12 hours a day and then go to sleep and then wake up and do it for you know and all this stuff but um yeah, yeah. I think it's really interesting too how you um created this traveler that was gathering and um and gathering nuggets of these intangibles you know yeah. like gathering the side eye, gathering yeah. the absolute bliss, you know, yeah. and to think about not just the things we carry, you know, if anyone's familiar with the epigenetics, the things we carry within our body, but the traits that we carry, um, and then take that into creating this um, sculpture that for what I noticed, like a lot of your figures, um, these like faceless sculptures that you can almost like project yourself into or see yourself into. Yeah. Yeah, I I really like that idea of um being able to like not only project yourself into it but kind of have a dialogue with this they're just like really good listeners, you know. It's like they yeah. they can never talk back, they can never you'll I don't know, and that's I think that was one of the things that I realized in grad school was that if I take away the mouth and the eyes those are two of the most important ways of, you know, communicating with someone else. And I think that that's kind of like, I don't know. I really like that division of like, this is, this is just for me. Like everything that I have is for me, everything that you want. Like, I can't give you anything, you know, like I can't give you, I cannot communicate how I feel or I cannot communicate what I want to say 
I'm just here, you know, and I'm taking up space and that's amazing. And I think that that's kind of like what I learned about my sculptures was that they don't have to answer to anybody. They literally just exist. And whatever you get out of them is what you get out of them. And I don't know. It's like almost, I don't know. And I think removing the face, it's, you know, like when you have a sense that's deprived in some way, it heightens your other senses. It's, you know, and so yeah. by removing the facial expressions, it emphasizes the gesture and the pose. And yeah. so then it's like almost like a way of focusing on these like nonverbal ways of we, of communicating. And then, you know, to go back to your technique is something you mentioned earlier as being a value to you and something that was early on a part of your practice and then combining that with your choice to hold on to um, chicken wire as your main material and then integrating that with other ubiquitous objects. You know, you've used yarn and trash bags and um, uh, like plaster and ice cream. I mean, ice cream, like these are all materials that we have some association with in some way or another. And yeah. I see that as a way of almost disarming another layer. It's like, there's not a facial expression. There's not, there's these materials that in isolation, I know what they are, but you combine them with technique to um, blur where they are. So there's nothing that kind of slows you down where you're like, wait, what? I know what that is. I know what that is. Like you first see this, this figure yes. and then you see the gesture and then you see the material and then you see the attention detail and you are, you have a bright colors and each layer you kind of draw people, invite people in with your yeah. work. That's, I do want that. Like I, I am so in love with the whole process of looking at art, you know, like the idea of like, I just love it. I love everything to do with art. I do too. Yeah. I love standing in line, waiting to get a ticket to go. There, <laughs> and then you go and you, you know, you're like, you get too close and it beeps and you're like, Oh shit. You know? And it's like, I just, I don't know when I, I feel most at peace when I'm creating and looking at art. And I think that like, it's, just for the next generation. I want the next generation of artists to feel that way about my art. And I want, like, I just love it. I just, I love that I'm able to express like what I, what is inside of me through this material and through this media. And it's like, it's just wild. I, I've never, like, I've never felt this way about anything else that I've ever made you know and I think that that's kind yeah. of that's it gives me a lot of joy and it the only thing that I do the thing that I want to do with that joy is give it to the next generation it's like man I feel good I want y'all to feel good so it's like, well that's so wonderful and admirable and how wonderful that like in this most recent body that your grandmother and left that impression to you to create work yeah. so you can leave that to others. And Marco Perez said, our grandmother had a very tough exterior. So chicken wire was a perfect medium because you can still get through chicken wire. And um, yeah. what a great way to kind of give a nod to her legacy. And, yeah. and thank you so much for sharing all of that about your work and just for your like dedication and joy and passion that is infectious. It's definitely been inspirational to me and I'm sure many others in your life. So so grateful for you participating and for a talented artist as yourself to join um, this show and look for so excited to see all the different things that you have for your future, um, not just the generations to come and really just so happy you're here. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you too. And thank you to Mata Gallery and everybody. And it was yeah. This thank is, you, Mika, for making this possible. Yes, thank you, Mika. <laughs> if anyone can donate, um, she's so generous and Jen volunteers all of her time for this and then gives everything back to the artists and the community. So um, there is a link, you know, you can either email or a link on um, Mata's website or DM through the Instagram. Um, but we are so, she made this all possible. So Nika, thank you for 
giving a platform for people like us and for artists of all different backgrounds and and everything to to be able to share and talk about the things we love yeah definitely 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 well hope everyone has a great weekend thanks matt it was so great i can't wait to hang out again in person but for now video will do (laughs) yes yeah 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 i'm uh yeah so thankful and yes i cannot wait to just yes double date we'll have a double date yep double date soon Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks for today. Thank you, everybody.